Bookbinding can be a really fun and rewarding hobby. Being able to hold and use something that you've made with your own hands is really satisfying. But it's not without its hazards. When I started out, I made all sorts of mistakes. But I tried to learn from all of them. Over the years, I've developed a few tricks of my own. If I'd known these things when I started out, it may have helped me avoid a few downfalls. And so I thought I'd put together this video and share some of them with you. So if you're interested in seeing some of the things that I do, then stay tuned and we'll go through a bunch of tips and tricks. 14 tips for you with some bonuses thrown in for good measure. So let's get to them. My first tip is about paper grain direction. In bookbinding, it's important to understand which way the grain is running so that you can align it parallel to the spine of the book. I check it first just by bending it in each direction. And from experience, I can determine based on how easily it flexes which direction the grain is running. But to be 100% certain, I cut a long corner in each direction. Then I wet one side of the paper with water and a sponge along both of the cut pieces. You'll see that immediately one will curl up and the other will remain fairly straight. The one that's straight is the one that's parallel to the grain direction of your paper. I'll mark this on my sample sheet and I'll also make notes about what the name of the paper is, the paper weight, where I got it. I store all of my paper samples together in a drawer. A binder would help organize this a little bit better, but at least this way I know where they are and I can find them if I need them. So once you get going bookbinding, you're going to want to make a lot of books. And that means counting out a lot of pages. The pages can be a little difficult to handle and count, especially if you want to make sure you have the same number of pages in each gathering. So I like to use this handy little tool. It's just a rubber fingertip. You can get it at the office supply store and they only cost a few cents. I use it to lift up the corner of each page, bending it a little bit so that I can then pick it up with my other hand. This way I can count out all of my pages quickly and accurately and get on to the fun stuff. As a bonus tip, once you've counted out all your pages, you can alternate them in a stack. This makes them a lot easier to handle and it makes them easier to count and move around as you work through your project. The tool that I reach for the most in the bindery is probably my bone folder. I use it for just about everything, not just folding. It's quite literally made just from an old bone. If you don't happen to have one of these, a great substitute is the everyday Sharpie marker. You know, just in case you want to make some books at the office or something. Not that I've ever done that. The smooth barrel of the pen works great for folding up signatures. If you're worried about the black ink rubbing off onto your paper, use a bit of fine sandpaper and just sand off all the writing. And then you've got a nice smooth plastic folder. As a bonus tip, the rounded end of a permanent marker makes a great creasing tool for cardboard when doing box making. Run it across the cardboard to make a firm crease, and then it'll fold nicely right along the line that you made. Or, if you want to be conventional, you could use it for writing. One of my favorite things in bookbinding is using big sheets of paper. I can fold them down to make signatures for books, and I get the satisfaction of folding paper, which is fun all on its own. One of the mistakes that I often made in my early days of bookbinding is that as the folds increase, the paper gets thicker and tends to bunch up in the corners, creating unsightly creases that will never come out of your book. Luckily, preventing this is easy if you happen to have a wide, sharp knife. Make your first and second fold as you normally would, but before making the third fold, I take the knife and I slit along the second fold, more than halfway along, but not all the way through. This allows the pages to be able to move freely as you make the third fold, and it'll prevent the bunching that happened before. You can keep going like this, just simply slitting along each fold as you go. You can see here how the folds are nice and crisp compared to the ones that I didn't slit the pages. I also use this technique when making my miniature books. The benefit here is that all the pages in the signature remain attached to each other, and with the tiny, tiny little pieces that I was working with, it made these little signatures a lot easier to handle. I like to wax my linen threads before I sew with them. 
I'll just run the thread over beeswax under my thumb with a little bit of pressure and that applies just enough wax to lubricate the thread and helps to keep twists out of it. If you don't have any beeswax though, an everyday candle works just as well. Once I've waxed the thread, I use my thumbnail to reduce any twist that's in it. This helps to prevent any unwanted tangles. As a bonus, if you've got some wax handy, you can rub it on your tools. When piercing sewing holes, I'll put some wax on my awl, and it helps it slip through the papers a little bit easier. You can't really see that here, but trust me, it does. So the real meat and potatoes of bookbinding is really sewing. And sewing means attaching thread to a needle. So this is how I do it. Of course, first, you put the thread through the eye of the needle. And then I pull through at least twice as much thread as the length of the needle itself. I then use the needle to flatten out a spot towards the end of the thread. And pierce it with the needle passing directly through the thread. I can then pull the rest of the thread down and the loose end I pull back over itself. This forms a secure knot that's also very slim and won't bind up when you're passing it through the holes in your paper. Once your needle's threaded and you're starting to sew, getting the tension right can be a little bit difficult. When I first started out, I would always pull in the wrong direction and rip a big hole in my papers. Then I'd have to undo everything, ditch that signature, and start over. Preventing this is actually pretty simple. Just remember that when you're pulling on your thread, pull parallel to the direction of the spine. That prevents pressure going against the thin paper, and you should be alright. If you sew enough books, this is going to happen to you. You get right to the end of your sewing and you don't have enough thread left to even get through the last sewing hole. So this is how I handle that. I cut the needle off and then put the needle through the hole without any thread at all. I then re-thread the needle and use that to pull the thread through the sewing hole. On the other side, if it's not your final stitch, you can use the loose end to attach a new thread. You can see my video linked above on how to do that. If it's the last stitch in your book, then you can use the needle to manipulate the thread to tie off your kettle stitch. But I find having a pair of fine tweezers really helps in delicate maneuvers like this. Pretty often in bookbinding, you're going to find yourself applying a lot of glue. That means using glue brushes. And while they don't last forever, there's a few things you can do to extend their lives. Before you even put the brush into the glue, moisten it with some water and wipe off the excess. This makes it easier to clean the glue out of the bristles later. If you need to put the brush down for a few minutes in the middle of a project, just put the wet brush right into a plastic bag and wrap it up tightly. In this way, you can leave the brush for up to an hour or so. If I need to store the brushes overnight and don't feel like cleaning them, I just put them in a jar of water on the bench. A little thing that I do when I'm gluing up the spines of my books is to close up all the sewing holes that I made. Because I pierced these holes with an awl, the paper is still there to be pushed back into the holes. This helps prevent any glue from seeping down inside the text block and sticking the pages together. It only takes a minute and it helps prevent any unwanted surprises when you open up the book when it's all done. A long ruler is a great tool to have in the bindery, especially when breaking down big pieces of paper. But what if you don't have one? Easy enough. A small ruler can stand in. Lay out your cut by making three marks, one at each end of the paper and another somewhere in the middle. Line up your ruler and start your cut, and then stop partway along near the middle mark. Slide the ruler down against the blade so that it extends over the end of the paper. Check your marks and then continue the cut. It's as easy as that. 
Having a press is a real luxury when you're making books, one that I appreciate every time I use it. But what if you don't have one? Well, there are a lot of different ways that you can put pressure on a book while your glue dries. A lot of them are just about applying weight. You can take your stack of to read books and put it on top. You can use that exercise equipment that's been gathering dust in the corner. You can press your books and stay hydrated with a big jug of water. Having an old brick is always a handy tool in the bindery. Or you can apply a spring clamp to your book to put some pressure on it. Or two. Or all the clamps. When gluing up a book, you can use parchment paper or plastic to prevent the glue from squeezing out onto the pages. But a convenient and thrifty alternative are label sheets. Just peel off any of the remaining label bits before you use these. Glue up your book as you normally would. Then you can insert the label papers with the shiny side facing the glued surface. I back those up with some blotting paper because the labels aren't really moisture proof, just moisture resistant. I can put those into the press. I like to give it a little nip and then I'll open it up again to check to see if there's any excess squeeze out before letting it stay overnight. The next day you can take your book out. You can see the papers have done their job and uh, nothing is stuck to the inside of the book. And hey, if you're still here watching the video, thanks very much. If you haven't subscribed already, then go ahead, click the button, and ring the bell so you get notifications for my new videos. Nobody likes washing up glue, but this is the easiest tip of them all, because you don't have to do anything. If your plastic glue container has become a little too crusty, or you run out of glue, just leave it on the bench overnight until it all dries up. The next day when it's all clear and dry, you can just peel it all off the inside and get the sweet satisfaction of a job well done. So that's all my tips for now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.